Is that better? Ah, technology. <laughs> so good morning, church. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is David Gibson. Uh, we are in a series over uh, Paul's first, uh, chapter, first letter to the Corinthians uh, called Not Your Normal. And today I've got the privilege to be able to share with you uh, a message from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So if you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to be, begin reading in verse 6. Verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit reaches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for, for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to look into your word and hear what you have to say through us through, the, through your Holy Spirit this morning. God, we pray that it's your message that's, that's preached because it's your message that we need to hear. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise and the glory for what you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I don't know about you fellas, but from time to time, my wife will send me on a shopping errand. And shopping is not my superpower. I'm, I'm not good at it. I usually get it wrong. And um, one time in particular I want to share with you, she sent me to Walmart, and at the time we lived, we didn't live in Poto, we lived across the mountain over in Whitesboro, was pastoring the church there, and she sent me to Walmart in Poto to get hairspray and lipstick. Why she couldn't go, I, I have no clue, I don't remember that, but I remember being traumatized by having to come to Walmart to get my wife some hairspray and list, lipstick, and listen, you had to have the correct ones. You can't just go in there and go, oh, this one looks pretty. You had to have her specific brand. And so I took my daughter with me, but I thought she would help me. But, you know, she was a typical teenager, didn't want to be seen with dad. And so she's off doing her thing. And this was several years ago, like 15 plus years ago. And so my first hurdle was to find the hairspray aisle. I found that semi-okay. And so I'm on the aisle. I'm looking for the hairspray, and I'm telling you. And so her instructions were, it would be easy to find. It's in a purple bottle with a kangaroo on it. Some of the ladies don't know, what, men don't know what I'm talking about. The ladies do. But it's in a purple bottle with a kangaroo. That's pretty specific. I figured I could find that. So I get to the hairspray aisle. There's hundreds of bottles of hairspray. Seven of them are purple, and four of them have a kangaroo on it. Different kinds. And so I'm like, what do I do? And so I'm trying to figure it out. I'm struggling. It's a struggle. I got, I got to get, I can't go home with the wrong one. So I'm struggling, and down the aisle comes an, a, another guy, and he's got the same struggle. I, I think he's looking for hairspray, and, but he's, he's talking to himself. Worse than talking to himself, he's arguing with himself. He's saying, I'm telling you, it's not here. I've looked this aisle 14 times, and it's not here. And then he stops for a minute, and he goes, okay, okay, third shelf, all the way to the left. Yep, there it is. Picks it up, leaves. I think, that's, that's just weird. <laughs> he had an argument with himself and won the argument. But anyway, so I, 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 I finally find, I pick out a purple bottle of hairspray with, a, with a, uh, a kangaroo on it. It's not the right one, but I take it anyway. I go to the next aisle because my next mission is lipstick. 
And I'm supposed to find, it has a hashtag, well, it's not a hashtag, it's a, you know, the number sign, and then a letter, and then some numbers after that. That's, that's how I'm supposed to find it. I could not find that anywhere. And I'm looking for that lipstick, can't find it, and I call my daughter, and she's on her way over, and about the time she gets to me to help me with the lipstick dilemma, the same guy comes walking down the aisle. And he's, he's still arguing with himself. He says, I can't find your lipstick. I've looked all over this. It's not here. And he goes, okay, top row, all the way. Yep, there it is. He picks it up, and he's gone. And so I'm, I'm grabbing my daughter and saying, don't get too close to this guy because he's crazy. <laughs> and she goes, Dad, he's not crazy. He's on a cell phone. And remember, this was 15 years ago. And I'm like, that's not a cell phone. I picked up my cell phone and flipped it open and said, this is a cell phone, which I thought was cool because I felt like Captain Kirk, you know, flipping my cell phone open. My daughter didn't think it was cool. But anyway, that, to me, that's what a cell phone was. And, but he had a, his technology allowed to have him uh, have an unseen, unheard presence with him that was helping him with the same struggle I was struggling with. I couldn't hear the voice he was hearing. I couldn't feel the presence that he was feeling, but he could. Through his cell phone in his pocket and the, the thing he had in his ear and the microphone that was with it, it boggled my, it sounded weird to me. It made him seem weird to me, but how cool was it that this virtual presence was able to give him a wisdom that I didn't have? He was able to have help with the issues that we were both struggling with. And the application of that is very simple for what we're talking about today. And we're talking about the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, you and I go through the same struggles as everybody else in the world. We all got to make a living. We all got to raise our kids. We've all got to do the things to live in this world that's required. We all have the same struggles, but the difference is we don't go through those struggles alone. We have a presence with us, not a virtual presence, but the real abiding presence of the enduring Holy Spirit of God. And listen, He helps us through every situation that we find ourselves in. The Bible says that the moment we heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and the moment we believed that gospel, that His Holy Spirit came into us and began to transform us into the very image of the one who bled and died to save us. The Holy Spirit inhabits every one of us who have believed on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so since then, we never go through one second alone. His Holy Spirit goes with us, filling us and guiding us and giving us wisdom. It might make us, his, his wisdom in us, His Spirit in us, and the wisdom it brings might at times make us seem not normal to the world around us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, in the way that we deal with certain issues, is so different than the way the world says to deal with them that we may seem a little bit odd to them. But listen, I will trade being filled with the Holy Spirit and the wisdom he brings over the normalness of the world any day. How about you? I'll, I'll, take, that, I'll take that deal any time. Our text today reminds us that it's through the work of the Holy Spirit in us that the wisdom of God is released in us and through us. Through the Holy Spirit that's in us, God works to unleash His wisdom on our behalf to help us overcome our um, uh, pressures and, and our challenges, but not just us. It's also to affect those we have the chance to witness to in our daily lives. Today, I want to take just a few moments to talk with you about the great benefits that we have in being filled with the Spirit of God and the wisdom that it brings. And so, benefit number one being filled with the Holy Spirit indwells and empowers us with great strength. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God empowers us with great strength. And the strength I'm talking about is the kind of strength that helps us to deal with the outward pressure, pressures of the world we live in. It's just an indisputable fact that living in this world brings pressures. I heard someone um, Say a while ago, they were on the struggle bus. Anybody feel like you're on a struggle bus today? You got some issues, some pressures. If you're not feeling pressure today, let me remind you that tomorrow is Monday. Can you already feel the pressure of Monday starting to creep in? Sunday's almost over. And you start thinking about all you got to do tomorrow and Tuesday, and, and those pressures begin to come, uh, come against you. But I'm here to tell you that the, that the, the feeling of the Holy Spirit 
gives us a wisdom that makes us stronger than any of those pressures that come against us. I have a little illustration I want to share with you. I'm a very, uh, um, I'm a visual learner. I have to see things and do things to get it. I can, you can tell me about it all day long, but until I can see it or do it, I don't get it. So I want to give you a little bit of a picture to take with you about today about what I'm talking about. So these two cans that I've got, they're made of the exact same stuff. They're both made of the exact same material. The only difference is one of them is filled and sealed. One is empty. And I'm going to subject, subject both of them to about the same amount of pressure. But watch, hap, watch what happens to the empty one as I apply the pressure. Now, I promise you, I'm squeezing just as hard on this one as I am this one. I could squeeze, and I'm not going to point it towards anybody. <laughs> I like to watch what you do. But notice this. The empty one crumbles under the pressure but the filled and sealed one handles the stress why it's, it's where does its strength come come from its strength doesn't come from what it's made of but it comes from what it's filled with being empty this one can't take the pressures of the world around it but being filled and sealed with something makes it stronger and able to to endure the pressures that's put upon it. And the Bible tells us that as Christians, we're the same way. We have the same power in us that makes us stronger than what we would be on our own. Let me share with you uh, a scripture from uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, he tells us this. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Listen to this. For he who is where? In you is greater than he who is in the world. It's just an indisputable fact that living in this world brings pressure. It brings stress. It brings a daily trip on the struggle bus. But listen, you have a power in you that makes you stronger than whatever the enemy throws against you. There's going to be Monday pressure. There's going to be Tuesday pressure. There's going to be Wednesday pressure. There's going to be pressure from the outside. The enemy wants to crush you but you have a power on the inside that makes you strong. It makes you, un, it, it makes you um, not normal, not normally strong, stronger than what's against you. The wisdom of the world tells us to look all kinds of places to help us with dealing with the pressures that come against us. What does Oprah say about it? What does Dr. Phil say about it? What does this book say about it? What does that book say about it? But the Bible tells us we don't have to look outside to find a power to help us. The Bible tells us that if we're Christians, if we know Jesus, we have a power already on the inside that's stronger than anything that can come against us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says this, We have this treasure, treasure in jars of clay. Our bodies, the Bible calls those jars of clay. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not of us. Listen to what he says. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. What is he saying? Why, are we, why do we go through the same pressures as the rest of the world, but yet we're not crushed? It's because it's not what we're made of that makes us strong. It's who we're filled with that makes us strong. In um, Psalms chapter 121, it says this, it says, the, David says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? He, he, he was, King David was in a, uh, a time in his life where he was looking up to the hills, and, he, and as he looked to the hills that surrounded him, he saw a force coming against him that he knew he wasn't able to uh, stand against. He knew that, that, that there were more soldiers coming against him than soldiers he had. There were more horses coming against him than horses that he had. There were more chariots of war coming against him than chariots of war that he had. He saw a pressure, he saw a force too great for the strength that he had. But as he looked at those mountains, he asked himself a question. Hey, where does my strength really come, come from? Look at what it says in the next verse. Verse 2, he realizes this. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He realized this. He said, my strength will never be enough. If I had 10 times the force that I have, it'll never be enough. My strength doesn't come from what I have. My strength comes from who I have on the inside of me. 
And so maybe you came in here this morning and that's you. You're where King David was. And you look to the hills around you. You look to the things that surround your life, the outward pressures of your life. And as you look at them, you realize it's too much for me. I can't stand under that weight. It's crushing me. What you need to realize this morning is there's a greater power than what you're made of. It comes from what you're filled with. The Bible tells us we need to do like, like David did and not look at ourselves, but look to the one who lives within us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Let him be your power. Let him be your strength. He is your ever-present help in time of need, the Bible tells us. And so, number one, in the first place, we have the, the Holy Spirit gives us strength to deal with the outer pressures that come against us, the outer challenges. But also, number two, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome the inside issues of our life. How many of you know that we have inward issues? You know, the Bible is very, um, very precise. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Transgressions are outward sins. Jesus was wounded. That's an outward bleeding. But he was also bruised. That's an inward bleeding for those things that afflict us on the inside. Listen, every one of us came in here this morning with an inward issue. Every one of us has something on the inside that nobody else knows about. You might say, not me. Listen, I'm telling you, all of us do. We all have inward struggles. Right now, as, as good as I look up here, this happened in the first service too, the sock on my left boot, has fallen down and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> and I want to pull, pull it up so bad, but I'm going to wait. But to see, the thing is, we often have inward issues that affect us outwardly, right? It, it, it affects us. Out. We, we have the, the things on the inside of us cause problems. And the thing is that the Holy Spirit has come to give us victories, not just over the outward things that everybody else sees, but he's come to give us victory over the inward things that nobody sees. And so i got one other little illustration I want to share with you to give you a visual picture of what the Holy Spirit does for those things, that, those inward issues that we struggle with all the time. And so these, these cups that I have represent our hearts, uh, our, 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 our souls, our, our hearts. And the ping pong balls that are in them represent those uh, struggles that we have. Maybe it's uh, shame. Maybe it's uh, greed, maybe it's stinginess, maybe it's pride, maybe it's anger, maybe it's some sin that we just can't, can't get rid of. And so um, the world has um, wisdom that says, I, I know how you can deal with those things. I know how you, can, how you can get rid of that shame once and for all. I know how you can get rid of guilt once and for all. I know how you can quit that sin once and for all. And so maybe we use willpower or maybe we use some other thing, but through whatever mean, we look to the wisdom of the world and say, you know what, I, I, can, I can get rid of that. We make a New Year's resolution and say, you know what, I'm not doing this one no more. I'm, we, get, we get our willpower built up. We said, I'm, I'm through with that one. I'm not going to do this one anymore. You know what the, what the Bible calls that? When we have something that's not good and we turn away from it, it's called repentance. And repentance is good. We need to have repentance. Listen, the gospel and that wisdom agree that repentance is a necessary thing. If you've got sin in your life, you need to turn from it. If I've got sin in my life, I need to get rid of it. I need to turn from it. But there's a problem with repentance all by itself. Repentance all by itself is never enough. Why? Because we're left empty. If all I've done is quit that and turned away from it, walked away from it, I'm still empty on the inside. And the problem is, even though I've said I'm not going to do it anymore, I'm still tempted by it. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not going to, you know, whatever it is, I'm not going to do that anymore. But in the back of your mind, after two or three days, you're like, man, that would be good, <laughs> right? You know that the Holy Spirit knows that you are enticed by that, that thing. And the thing about human nature is we cannot leave our heart in a void. We are go the human nature is going to fill our heart with something. Something's going to go in there. And the Bible tells us, and I'll show you in a minute where it says it, that after a time we'll probably begin to fill that with the same things that we repented from. We'll put it back in there. Well, that's just one little thing nobody sees. 
But being empty, there's a void there. And those things come against us. And maybe we're having a weak day and we give into it. And before you know it, they're back in our life. And here's what Jesus says about it. I want to share you with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. And Jesus talks about this very thing. And here's what he says. This is from Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. He says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, when these things, these inward issues, when they're gone, it passes through, get this, waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from where, uh, from where I came. And when he comes, he finds the house how? Empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself and they, and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that person is worse than the first. Jesus agrees with what I'm saying that left empty, you're left powerless and when those things, when you have a, a weak moment and that thing comes back, uh, back, back to you, being empty, it finds a place in you and it gets stuck in there. And Jesus said it's not only like, as bad as it was before but it's worse. Jesus says that, that those things come and they're even worse. He brought seven more spirits even worse than he was. What Jesus is trying to tell us is, listen, repentance is needed, repentance is necessary, but repentance by itself is not enough. You need something else. You need something to fill the void. And Jesus said, you need me. You need my Holy Spirit in there to help you battle those things that nobody else sees. And so here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible says that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we hear his gospel and believe it, that his Holy Spirit begins to fill us. And now, I'm going to use for an example of the, the Spirit, the water that's in this picture. That's biblical to do that because the Bible tells us that one of the, one of the three ways that the Spirit's often depicted in, the, in Scripture is by fire, by wind, and by water. We see all three of those manifested on the day of Pentecost we see that they said that when the Spirit came, he sounded like a mighty rushing wind. Fire set on the heads of each believer. And when Peter explained to the people what was going on, he said, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, on that day, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And so what he's saying to us is that being empty is a problem because being empty, those things can get back and make you give you a worse situation than you had before. What you need is the Holy Spirit. Listen, Here's what religion says. Here's what the world says. The world says get rid of those things and then come to Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you with that shame. Jesus doesn't want you with that pride. Jesus doesn't want you with that guilt, with that sin. But the gospel says, Jesus says, come to me just as you are with all your shame, with all your guilt, with all your sin, with all your issues, with all your challenges. Come to me just as you are and I'll begin to fill you with my Holy Spirit and my Holy Spirit will crowd those things out of your life. Some of them always get stuck on the top, so the mighty hand of God is just going to sweep them away. <laughs> it's not a perfect example, but it's the best I got. But you see what I'm getting at is that empty, we're not enough. We can't just stop it because it'll come back worse than it ever was before. But Jesus said, if you'll let me in, just as you are, don't, don't worry about getting rid of it. Let me in, and I'll take care of it. I'll crowd those things out of your life. This is what Jesus tells us. This is the wisdom of the Spirit that he, that he puts in us. And so, um, so, like I said, Jesus said that oftentimes those things come back and they're worse than they were before. But I believe that this scripture, Jesus is telling us, listen, you need more than repentance. You need my Holy Spirit. You need my power in you. And look what happens. When those things come back now, because they will, we're still tempted by the same things. The Bible says that we're still tempted, that the enemy knows what we want, and he tempts us with those things. But notice when they come back, they find no purchase in us. They find no more place in us. They can't get down deep inside of us anymore. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is there to keep them out forever. We've been filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit, and the evil spirits can't have us. So, you know, we go to church. The Bible says a little washing of the water by the Word of God. <laughs> And those things, a little worship and those things are gone. Why? Because we have something in us that's more powerful than those things that try to come back and fill us. What's, he who is in us is greater than he who's in the world. And so Jesus says, come to me with all your issues, with all your guilt, with all your shame, whatever it is, come to me and my spirit will crowd it out of your life. 
Now, here's an issue that I need to share with you before I move on. I want to share what, something that um, the Apostle Paul said to us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Notice what he says. It's kind of a warning about this process. The Apostle Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's that process. Walk with the Spirit. Stay full of the Spirit, and you won't, those, those, those things of the flesh won't find purchase in you. Look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. He says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be what? Filled with what? The Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now here's my question. Since the Apostle Paul says we need to walk with the Spirit or walk in step with the Spirit, is it possible to walk out of step with the Holy Spirit? Since he says be sure and be filled with the Spirit, is it possible to be less than filled with the Holy Spirit? I think it is. I think the Apostle Paul agrees with that assessment. Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. He says, do not quench the Spirit. And that word quench means to stop. Don't stop the process that the Holy Spirit has begun in you. This process has started. The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer in Christ, His Spirit's in you. It's working to crowd out those things that you're struggling with. But we have the power to stop that process. We have the power to get our mind off of Jesus and onto these other things, and the process stops. Here's what I think happens most of the time. I think that we come to Jesus with our, with our guilt. We're, we're, we're sorry for our sin. We want to repent. We want to get better. We want to be made full of His Spirit. And His Spirit begins to do a work in us. And He goes to work, and those things begin to be crowded out of us. There goes the shame. There goes the guilt. There goes some anger. But at some point, we stop and go, you know what? That's enough. I'm satisfied with that amount of the Spirit. I kind of like the orange one. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get rid of I, I don't hate that one so bad. Right? I'm satisfied with the amount. We call it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And at some point, we can get to a point to where we say, you know what? I'm sad. I've got enough. I've got Never mind that there's more available. We get to the point to where we say, that's enough. That's enough. And, and, and by and by, what happens is we get satisfied and we stop. We quench the Spirit. So what do you do? If, so, and that might be you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you hear the Holy Spirit saying to you, you've been satisfied with what I've done up till now. And really, you're a little bit afraid of what I want to do. <laughs> I've got more I want to do in your life, the Holy Spirit says, but you won't let me continue that process. You got satisfied and you stopped. If that's you, if you know that, that, that you've had more of the anointing of the Spirit in your life than you've got right now, what can you do? And if you want Him to get back to that process, what can you do? Real quick, there's three things I want to share with you. Um, I should have had A, B, C instead of one, two, three for whoever's running my stuff back there. But look at what, uh, but there's, there's three things we can do. Number one, we can get back to real worship. We can get back to worshiping. I don't know about you, but when I, sometimes when I come into church in the morning, on Sunday morning, I feel the presence, I feel the pressures of my week. I feel like maybe I've stopped letting the Holy Spirit do what he wants to. I feel like maybe I've quenched his spirit this week. But when they start to sing, and I start to lift up my hands and praise the one who died for me. I can feel that spirit come alive in me and begin to move in me and begin to fill me again. And those things that I struggle with, they begin to lose their power against me. My, my wife and I used to work in the same building a few, uh, several years ago. And I would go to her office sometimes because that's where the snacks were. <laughs> I, I wanted to see her too. So I was just going, but she had snacks in there. And sometimes I'd go in there and uh, she, she'd have... Um, maybe ACDC on a radio or, or ZZ Top or something like that. And I knew that day, hey, things were going pretty good. She's having a good day. She's just listening to the music she likes. And um, you know, maybe George Strait, I don't know, some of you, some of you are, are more, more of a country side of the uh, uh, folks this morning. But I don't know, maybe she, she had some kind of some feel-good music that, that she liked. But then some days I would go in there, and she's got Toby Mac on there. Or, um, or she's got... Um, 
some, some, some of her other worship music playing that she, that she likes. And I know that that day, the spirit's a little low. That day, she's had a challenge. That day, something came against her from the enemy. And that day, she needed to get back to worship. You know what happened? The Holy Spirit began to take care of that issue. The Holy Spirit began to fill her again and begin to take those things and crowd those things out of her life. We need to get back to worship if we feel like the Spirit's been quenched in us. And then number two, or the second thing we can do, we can turn our attention back to Jesus. I believe that what happens sometimes in this process is that we just simply get our focus off of Jesus. We start looking to other things. Um, you know, springtime, some of us guys are thinking about turkeys or the fish biting, whatever else, whatever it is. We get, to, we get our eyes off of Jesus. And when we get our eyes off of Jesus, I promise you, the Spirit is going to be quenched. What the, the process, this process is going to be stalled out. So what do we do? We get our minds back on Jesus. We get our focus back on Him. I want to share with you what it says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it tells us this. He said, We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What's he saying? If I've got an issue with pride, and I just can't seem to shake it, what do I do? I turn my attention to the one who has no pride. And as I... As I Behold, His glory, His Spirit goes to work in me to get rid of my pride. Maybe I've got, um, maybe I've got greed issues, and I just can't, you know, the Holy Spirit's been telling me to, to give a certain amount, and I just, I'm just not going to do it. I like that one. I'm leaving that one. But I look at the one, but I realize the Holy Spirit wants to root that out of my life. He wants to root my greed out of my life. What do I do? I turn my attention to the one who has no greed, the one who gave every, everything he had to save me. As I look at the one with no greed, his spirit goes to work in me to root out the greed in my life. What can we do if we've quenched the spirit? We can worship. We can get our attention back on Jesus. And then the last thing that we can do is that we can pray. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. It says, If you then who are evil, this is Jesus concluding a teaching on prayer. He says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask. If you came in here this morning and you realize through this message that that, you know what, I, I've been satisfied with the amount of spirit at work in my life. I, I, I've quenched, I've, I've allowed that process to stop. You know what you can do to get it going again? Just pray and say, God, I know you've got more you want to do in my life. Today, would you fill me again with your spirit? Do you think for a second God will say no? He gives freely the spirit to those who ask. We can pray. And so the last thing I want to share with you is this, and on my notes that I have with my guy back there, it's probably number three. But the last thing I want to share with you is this. This process is not about me. It's not about me. Thank God that His Holy Spirit filling up me gives me victories over those pressures that come against me. He gives me victory over those issues that I carry within me. But it's not just about me. What God is doing in me needs to come from me and affect those around me. If I took this full cup of water and I gave it to somebody on the end of one of these rows and said, hey, pass this cup of water down the row, what's going to happen to all the people in that row? <laughs> They're no longer going to be a dry place. Some of that water is going to spill out onto them. That's the picture we need to take with us when we leave, that we are a full vessel full of the Holy Spirit of God. And everywhere we go, we're to spill out onto those around me until they say, you know what? I like what spilled out from that guy onto me. I like it. what came from her to me t today, just being around her, it tasted good. It felt good. I want some more of that. And that's going to entice them to be able to be opened up for you to be a witness for Jesus, the one who has filled you and given you the victory. It's not about me. But it's about those around me. Here's what the Bible says. What the Bible says in John 
chapter 7 and verse 38. He says, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow what? Rivers of living water. I'm not to just bottle this process up. I'm not just to, to bottle up the Holy Spirit that's in me that gives me wisdom to deal with my day, to, get to, to, to deal with the stressors of my life. I'm supposed to give of him to those around me. I'm supposed to open up and let the spirit that's in me flow out to those around me to, to inspire them to come to the one who saved me and sealed me and filled me. One last scripture I want to share with you. This is from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says, To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that works where? Within us. This process. This power, this Holy Spirit is in us. And God wants to do mighty things in Podo. But he's only going to do it through those of us who will take what we're filled with and give it out to those who are empty. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this spirit of wisdom that you've given us, for the victories that he brings us. God, your, Jesus, your blood would have been enough. Your salvation would have been enough. But beyond that, you filled us with your Holy Spirit of wisdom to give us victory over those things that come against us on the outside, those issues we all deal with on the inside, but mostly to empower us to go to those who are em empty and give them a taste of what you've given us. Lord, I just pray for those who are here today who have realized, God, I've, let you, I've quenched your spirit. I've stopped the process your spirit began in me. Lord, let today be the day they just ask and say, God, would you fill me again? Would you once, one more time let your Holy Spirit move in me and fill me? God, I pray mostly for those who might be here today who are empty, completely empty, because they've never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God, let today be the day of their filling. Let today be the day they finally say yes to Jesus and open their hearts and let Him come in and be their Savior. Lord, we give you this time of invitation. Do with it what needs to be done, and we'll give you the glory and the praise for what you do. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand for a time of invitation?